ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه اما بعد فيا عباد الله اوصيكم واوصي نفسي بتقوى الله اتقوا الله في السر والعلانيه اتقوا الله ويعلمكم الله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow him until the day of judgment. And I advise you and I enjoin you and I enjoin myself and I advise myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having taqwa, fulfilling his commands outwardly and inwardly and avoiding his prohibitions outwardly and inwardly. O oh, you who believe, have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the last and the final and the most precious of messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the creation with the book of Allah, the Quran, the last and the final message to mankind, the only book that has been remained unchanged from the books of revelation. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us belief and steadfastness and action upon the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the things that we see in the surahs that were mentioned during the time of Mecca is a lot of focus on the concept of the akhirah, of the next life. And to stress that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only mentions the sa'ah, mentions the final hour, but describes it and describes it in detail. Why? One of the reasons is that the people that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent to were people that had become so engrossed in the dunya. They had become drunk with the dunya. They have held on to the dunya so much that, 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 that they thought this dunya in front of them is the only thing there is. To the point that one of the Kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelieving pagans of Quraysh, he asked the Prophet وسلم, he said, you talk about resurrection. Will Allah take these dry bones? And he took some bones of an animal that were old and he crumbled them up and he made them into dust. He said, will these, the dust particles of this bone, will this come back to life? This thing that you're telling us about the resurrection and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to that saying, yes, Allah will bring those bones back to life. But this is the mentality that the people have. They're people of the dunya in the sense that this is, they think that this is the final state. That we are just some combination of carbon in some various, in various ways and we're going to dissolve and then who knows what's going to happen to the universe. No, we know exactly what's going to happen to the universe. Not that we just think the universe will come to an end. We believe it. It's part of our deen. One of the pillars of faith is the belief in the sa'a. But what does this mean? What does it mean that as a Muslim we believe in Allah, in His angels, in His messengers, in His books, in the Qadr, in His divine ordainment, that things don't happen by chance. They happen because Allah wanted them to happen. And they happen because Allah made them happen. And we also believe in the final hour, the sa'a. But what does this mean? That we just believe it? Or is it something to also help our action? Is this belief something that can influence our action? Why do we pray? Do we pray because it's a good habit? Do we pray because it's a meditation? Do we pray because it helps us get time management? Do we pray because it helps us order our day? Does it, do we pray just like some people do meditation or yoga or other types of spiritual meditations? Is that the reason? Or is it because we believe in Allah and He told us to do that? Why do we fast? Health reasons? Meditation reasons? To feel with the poor? It's because Allah said to do it and we do it. So the belief precedes the action. But the action is what shows the belief is there. Now this doesn't mean that if a person doesn't have action, they don't have belief. We're not saying that. A person can believe in all of the pillars of Islam and be a strong believer, but they don't have actions. They're not the strongest of the believers, but they do have belief. But we have to follow our belief up with action. So what action will belief in the sa'ah, in the final hour, what action will that influence? <coughs> One of the sahaba, 
a Bedouin man came to the Prophet and there are many, many wisdoms from this interaction. So listen closely. Because you may have heard this hadith and you may have heard another hadith and we're going to join them together and show the wisdom, the insight, and the educational method of the Prophet and his compassion with the people. A man asked the Prophet when is the sa'ah? When is the final hour? That's all he asked. When is the final hour? Now we have to remember why they're asking this. Because they know this is the man. This is the point of wahi. This is the point of revelation. This is the man who when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to speak to his creation, he speaks on the tongue of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is manba'ul wahi. The source of wahi. To the point that all previous traditions have to be in, 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 in accordance with his tradition or they're abrogated. If somebody comes and says, we have a remnant of revelation from a previous tradition, we want to follow that. We say, no, Allah has canceled out all other previous laws and traditions and methods of worship with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The example they give is like the stars and the sun. Every star out there is a sun. Our, star, our sun here is a star. And all of the prophets and all of the messengers who came, the best of humankind, alayhim <laughs> salam, may Allah send peace on every single one of them. And they each came and had a tradition. And they each, some of them had messages or affirmed previous messages. <laughs> But when the Sharia of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, it was like when the sun rises and you can no longer see any other stars in the night sky. Before that sun rises, you can use the other stars to guide. I'm going to follow the North Star, I'll follow Thraya, the Pleiades, I'll follow Orion's Belt, I'll follow this star to help me navigate through life spiritually. I'll follow that prophet in his way. I'll follow that prophet in his way. But when the sun comes, stars are no longer there. We can't claim that we're following another star. We're following the sun for our directions. And that is the likeness of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is this source of revelation. That when a person has a question, if they want to know, what does Allah, what does the Lord of the universe, the creator of the universe, what does he say about that? They go to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they ask him. So they said, Allah is telling us about the final hour, you would know about this. When is it going to happen? Now look at the response of the Prophet ﷺ. Now one thing to remember is that the time of the final hour is from مفاتيح الغيب, from the five matters that only Allah knows. This man, Muhammad ﷺ, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he knew so much about the world, the seen and the unseen. The mulk and the malakut, the bahir and the ghayb. But he didn't know five matters and one of them is the sa'a. That's why when Jibreel alayhi salam asked him, when is the final hour? He said, only Allah knows. Tell me the signs. So here's the sahaba trying to understand, okay, this very important point in creation. The final hour, the end of time, the end of creation. When is it going to happen? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't say, that's something that only Allah knows. That's it. That was his response when Jibreel asked. But in this man, he said, what have you prepared? What have you prepared for it? What? Two words. Two dhamirs. A dhamir and a half. Four or five parts of the Arabic structure. And it has a deep meaning. This is one of the this is one of the things that only the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given. Jawam al kalim, a few words that you can extract vast amounts of meanings. So think about that scenario. Think about when you have reflected upon the final hour. You've looked up at the skies and you've thought about those surahs in the Quran that talks about the destructions of the heavens and the earth. When the mountains will be turned into ibn al manfush like uh, wool. When the sun and the moon and the stars, everything will be annihilated. We've all thought about that. And we may have asked ourselves, when is it going to be? And we may have asked ourselves, I wonder if it will happen in my lifetime. 
I wonder if it will happen in my lifetime. I wonder if it will happen today. <clears throat> the sa'a, we don't know when it's going to happen, but according to some narrations, it will happen on a Friday, a Jum'ah. And then according to another narration, that every creature in the world, on this day, on Friday, they're, they're waiting, they're anxious. They're very anxious, because they're wondering, is it today? Except for the thaqarin, the humans and the jinn. We're just running around like not a care in the world. Not even thinking it could be today. <laughs> so we have to have this presence of mind about the sa'ar. We have to think about when it's going to happen. But more so than even thinking about when it's going to happen and whether or not it's going to occur in our lifetime. We have to think about... This wisdom that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the source of wahi, the source of revelation, told this man, and by extension told all of us, what have you prepared for it? In other words, we know it's going to happen. Are we going to sit around and become very anxious about the sa'a happening? Or are we prepared to meet it? Are we prepared to meet it? And the smaller sa'a in our life, the lesser final hour in our life is our death. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all long, healthy lives full of ta'a, full of obedience to Allah, and full of following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will all meet our hour, even if that final hour might be a thousand away, years away, or ten thousand years away. No one knows how long it will be. Any person that puts a time limit on when the sa'a, think to yourself, this is a dajjal, imposter, this is a cult, and move away from the person. The scholars have even said all of the ahadith that mention a specific age to the, to the earth, those are all fabricated hadith or weak. Anything that says the earth is this long and it, then it will end, and if somebody comes with a numerical figuring out of with this ayah and these numbers and so forth, the sa'a would be this time. If the Rasul alayhi salatu was salam didn't know when the sa'a would be, then how would somebody who knows mathematic, mathematical equations know when the sa'a is going to be? But more important than that is how does it reflect on our actions? How are we, are we acting like there will be a sa'a? Are we acting like there's going to be a final hour for all of creation? Are we acting like there's going to be a final hour for us? Because there will be a final hour for us. It's already written. That hour that we will spend right before our death, that's there. It's, it's going to happen. Are we acting as if it's going to happen? And again, not to where we're so afraid to do anything because we know it's going to be, happen and we become anxious, but we start preparing for it. And this was the question of the Messenger of Allah. <laughs> what have you prepared for it? So now we think on a daily basis. What have I done to prepare for the sa'a? What things have I put in store? What good actions have I accumulated? Have I really taken every opportunity to do something for my akhir? Because remember the state of mind of Quraysh, crumbling those bones. There's people now all over the world right now, crumbling bones and say, this is all we are. We're warm food, right? That's what they say. What's the big deal about us? We're worm food. We're going to decompose, become carbon, become go back to our organic material, and then later on we'll become a plant or something else. Or, but I'm God. No. We know for a fact, yes, we have a body here. This is not an illusion. But this is temporary. Our final abode is a Dar al-Akhirah. Our final abode is a Dar al-Akhirah, the next life. And so we have to be preparing for it. If we knew that a disaster was going to happen, today I was shopping and I saw these disaster kits they have, which we should be prepared. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had rations for one to be able to support him for one year and his family. One year, he already had that long before FEMA and emergency preparedness uh, advice and so forth. The Rasul alayhi salatu wasallam taught us in his sunnah: be prepared, have rations on hand. But people are prepared for a disaster. Now what if a disaster, if we knew it was about to come? Think of the mindset that we would be. What would we buy? What type of rations would we, would we buy? What would become important at that point in our life? In a similar fashion, but not the same exact way, 
when we're preparing for the sa'ah, we have to be in a state of mind where we know it's going to happen and we're going to take every opportunity to benefit ourselves for the next life. And that's the difference between the person who believes in the next life. This is a stopping point. This life that we live in, it's a way station. It's a bus station. It's an, it's an airport. Anybody who's ever been through a, a bus station or a train station or an airport, you know that feeling, especially at nighttime when there's not many flights and there's not many people there. Nobody lives at the airport. Nobody starts preparing like, I'm going to set up camp here and this is where I'm going to live. They know when they go into the airport, this is just a point of travel. This is the station and I'm going to another station. This is the dunya for us. And I remind us, especially too here in the Bay Area where we are living in the top 3% of the world economically. As we see so many disasters going on all over the world. Wars. Natural disasters. If any of you don't know about the water crisis in Cape Town, South Africa, look it up. Think about what's going on over there when you see people scrambling to get water on a daily basis. Everybody. Including Muslims because there's a large poor, uh, population of Muslims there and they're scrambling to get water there. That, those are our Muslim brothers and sisters that are over there in that situation. Those are our human sisters and brothers over there in that situation. What's to prevent it from happening anywhere else in the world? We're living free right now. We have water, at least now because of the rains that came last year. But it could get worse here. And a lot of people who predict, predict uh, problems with water in the future. But whether or not we reach that, we should think about the safety and the security that we have here in our locale. And we should think about the security of housing and the security of food and the availability of those things that we have. That we are in a position where we don't have to think about our daily water. And we don't have to think about making sure not to have one of the, 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 the bombs of the coalition fall upon us in Syria or Afghanistan or hit by a drone in Yemen. We don't have to think about those things. So what are we going to do with that freedom? What are we going to do with that safety and security that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with? It's not something that we should feel guilty about. This is the blessing of Allah. One of the Sahaba was walking one time and the Prophet saw him, he was wearing raggedy clothes, old clothes, torn up clothes. And he asked about him. He said, who is this person? They told him, is he wealthy or is he poor? Why is he dressed like that? They said, no, he has money. He's just doing that. He called him over and he asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, out of humility. He wants to show his humility by wearing old, old clothes. And the Prophet وسلم, recited to him the surah that many of us recite in our prayers on a daily basis. As for the blessings of your Lord, then proclaim them, speak about them, tell the world about the blessings. Not out of arrogance, but because we know that Allah is the one who gave us this blessing. And he said in the hadith, he said that Allah loves to see the traces of his blessings on his servants. So it's a type of ibadah. When we show those blessings, we don't, we don't become arrogant when we show them, but we also shouldn't abase ourselves and become lowly. We're in the middle. The best of the ways is the middle ways. So now we ask ourselves here, with the wealth that our community has, and with the safety and the security that we have, are we preparing for the sa'a? And this is a question that anybody, even in a disaster, should be asking themselves. Are we preparing for the sa'a? Are we doing things to get our life in order? Are we taking advantage of every opportunity? Are we praying five times a day? Because that's the first thing that we will be asked about on this hour. Are we praying five times a day? If we're struggling with that, then we work on that. Okay, we're praying five times a day. Am I praying properly at the beginning of time? with proper presence in the prayer and constantly working on that and all of the other ibadah we audit them on a continuous basis and we see are we improving and the same thing in our mu'amalat and in our interactions with people are we treating people fairly? are we treating our spouse fairly? are we treating our children fairly and our friends and our employees and our employers and our fellow community members are we treating them fairly? are we thinking about them? 
Are we thinking that this interaction that I'm having with this person, even if I'm not giving sadaqah, even if I'm not making a prayer, this interaction could be something for me on Yom al Qiyamah, and I'm preparing that for the sa'ah. So take every opportunity to smile at the person and to bring bashasha. The Prophet told, told, us, told us that even having a good face with your friend, with your fellow Muslim, is a sadaqah, is a charity. Are we acting like that? Are we taking every opportunity? Are we taking opportunity to give ourselves a mission in life? A mission in life. So yes, we have our ibadah, our worship. And we have our iman that precedes it. And we have our good interactions with people, but have we each individual one of us, have we picked something in life that we say, that's what I'm going to work on. That's what I'm going to do. I was just telling a young girl in the message here earlier, I showed her a plastic bottle, and I said, I hope in your generation, this is no longer existing. Because we do have the ability to make biodegradable plastic. This is just an example. There's a Muslim in Indonesia right now that has made biodegradable plastic that you can stir up after you use it and drink it. It's made out of a root. But we know the multinational corporations with their multi-billion dollar lobbying will not let plastic die. But that might be something that a person, a Muslim, says, I'm going to change this little portion of the world. Or somebody says, I'm going to help the orphans in this place. Or I'm going to build a school somewhere. Or I'm going to do something. Because we have to remember, not only as Muslims, but as Muslims in the Bay Area, living in the top 3% of the world economically, we have a duty to spread that blessing to the rest of the world and to our community here. But if each one of us took on something and said, I'm going to do that and I'm going to do it right. Orphans, wells, education, urban housing, whatever it might be, something. Are we really just going to go before the sa'a and just say, I have my prayer and my ibadah and I have a few good deeds and that's it. Or are we saying we want to have more prepared? And that's what the Rasul Ali Salatu was asking this so man. When he asked him about the sa'a, he said, Mada What have you prepared for it? To remind him, don't think about when it's going to happen because it is going to happen. Think about how you're going to prepare for it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and the taqwa to be able to fulfill that preparation for the final hour. <laughs> we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send peace and blessings upon his last and final and best of messengers Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them until the day of judgment. And I enjoin you and I enjoin myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taqwa being fulfilling the obligations of Allah outwardly and inwardly and avoiding his prohibitions outwardly and inwardly. We'll end on another interaction between the Prophet وسلم, and this man. Just to remind us to put things in perspective. Many of us are familiar with the story of the Prophet وسلم, where a man came into the masjid and because he was a Bedouin man, and they're not used to civilized matters, and they're used to, if they need to, relieve themselves, it's all sand in the desert, so that's where they would go. He comes into the masjid, it's a sandy floor, and then he relieves himself on the sand in the floor after asking some questions. And the Sahaba were amazed that he could do this and wanted to stop him from doing it, and the Prophet ﷺ told him, let him fish. And then afterwards, after pushing them away, he explained to him in a very compassionate way, this, is built, this, this place is built for worship. And we keep away from it foul things, foul language and, and, and filth, filth from our bodies. And he explained it in a very compassionate way. This man was the man that just asked about when is the sa'a. So he asked about the sa'a, and there was that whole process. To the point that when the Prophet said, what have you prepared for it? He actually had an answer too. He said, I haven't done a lot of prayers. And I haven't done a lot of fasts. But I love Allah and His Messenger. And the Prophet said, you will be with the ones you love. 
You will be with the ones you love. And the Sahaba said, this was the most joyous day for them when they heard these words from the source of Wahi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You will be with the ones you love. Because they said, we love Allah and we love His Messenger. And we will, we, and this is a, a glad tidings for us that we will be with Him. So yes, we have to have actions. But then at the end of the day, we have to have make sure that we have love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how does that translate? If we don't have love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how is our interactions going to be with people? If we're really following him. In this situation, he was compassionate with the person that made a huge blunder in the masjid. Now think about how you might have been corrected in a masjid. Or think about how we might have corrected somebody else in a masjid. Or think about how somebody, a child or somebody new to Islam or somebody who's not Muslim visits a masjid. How are they corrected in a masjid? This is the status quo for how we should be correcting the, 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 anybody in a masjid. The way the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa dealt with somebody compassionately. And was it jumping to conclusions about their state? And ask them, what do you have? And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the love of Him, to the, the love of Allah and the love of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to have full and complete iman in Him, in His book, in His angels, in the messengers and follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us steadfastness so that when our final hour comes or when the final hour comes, we will be able to leave this dunya with La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to fill our scales of good deeds with many, many actions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to overlook our bad actions and to turn our bad actions into good actions. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nisa'i lil muslimin wa al-muslimat wa al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat wa aqimis salat.